Hello, Las Vegas Creators United. I'm Michael Curry, and I'm really excited, really proud, to give you a tour of my world, my studio here in Oregon, and to talk a bit about my work, but most importantly, the association with Las Vegas, and some insights for my 30 years of working in Las Vegas, and some of the, uh, I wanted to share some of the um, wonderful, fun facts about Las Vegas, uh, sort of remind the world how special the place is, how unique it is, how, how much of an oddball, quirky place that the inter entertainment capital of the world really is. And talk a little bit about, uh, from the inside out, you know, I'm not a performer, but a designer and uh, a facilitator of performance. I would be nothing without performance, as all creators would be. And I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the time we are finding ourselves in now, three, four months without live theater. Um, I have 45 shows around the world that are dark. I have one show that is light in Japan. It's an interesting time, but not. I'm not going to sit here and talk about the pity that we have for ourselves, but rather some of the, some of the encouraging things and some of the coping mechanisms that artists in general have and how we're looking at this world and, and maybe even taking a, a glance inward and take the time to really reevaluate what it is we do and how it connects to us and how it nourishes us. Um, every artist, and I, you know, when, I, when you think of Las Vegas, there's so many beautiful performance forms and every dancer, every acrobat, every magician, every musician, every producer, every stagehand, every computer operator has to have had work, worked so hard to get to their position. What to do when you put in all that hard work and you find yourself in this spot where you can't practice your craft? Um, it can be debilitating and demoralizing, which it is. It's a very sad time. I'm not painting a picture of anything but that. But I do want to say that a chance for self-reflection for an artist to suddenly not be speaking to an audience but rather being uh, evaluating their own their own form their own work evaluating how hard of effort they put into getting to this point of perfection um, and how they have to continue to keep not only the skills that they've learned but keep their body in the physical form the performance form to be able to deliver that very expert level that you've achieved. It's a very difficult time, just this stasis. We find ourselves in this purgatory. But I want to talk a little bit about making lemonade from lemons and uh, also share with you my studio, share with you some pieces from Las Vegas shows, some of you're familiar with, uh, some of them not. Talk about some of, the, uh, some of the experiences I've had with some of the great creatives and incredible innovators in Las Vegas. So. Without further ado, I'll just kind of give you a, a briefing of my studio. We'll go to some different locations, and then I'll pop on some pictures as I'm talking about some of these things. But I couldn't be more proud and excited. It's my favorite place in the world, my studio in Scappoose, Oregon. It's my place of power. And it's, I've worked very hard over the last 30 years to put together a team of 54 brilliant artists, many of who have been with me for 20 years. And by living in a unique place like Las Vegas, or in my case, Scappoose, Oregon, there's a, there's a focus. Some of the rest of the world is washed away, and you can really feel the bloodstream of that particular focus. Las Vegas is that kind of place. You know, there's, there's two million people around the metropolitan area, but 600 people downtown. But within that community is the most extraordinary concentration of artists, past and present, because you also remember that people that had a career in the entertainment world in Las Vegas love living there. It's a wonderful place to retire. So hidden within the, the perimeters of Las Vegas and within it itself is this incredible backlog of historically important performers, innovators, as well as the current level of all the shows we have and those current performers. So what has happened over the 40 and 50 years that it has really been this Mecca has been this accumulation of cultural spirit, experience, uh, a sophistication, and it's, it belies a sort of common assumption of Las Vegas that it's always raw and cutting edge, and, but no, it's actually a really wonderful 
place for some great artists to uh, practice and to, in many cases, retire there and still give back to the community. Much of what Franco Dragon's program is, with this program, is to try to give back the sense of, uh, of, of, of gratitude we have for the community ourselves. The audience, that's one thing. They'll always be there. People are, they're going to put the money down to see extraordinary things. But the artists themselves, the creators, and every support position from administration to the, the backstage crews, these are, these are people that I work with as much as I do the stars who are on stage. And I want to take a moment to really kind of uh, refresh our gratitude for, for them and that hard work because they're the first to get to the theater and the last to leave. And they don't get to take a curtain call. So with that, I'm going to walk you around. I started my career in New York. I was in Manhattan. I was there for a long time. I made a good mark on Broadway. I switched from being a gallery artist in New York where I was a painter and sculptor. Started making my sculptures move. Before long, I was asked to put it on stage. Uh, young innovators, Julie Taymor, Robert Lepage, in those years, in the 80s, um, this sort of movie special effects and things were, were new and they weren't yet seen in live theater. So I think some of the function that I served for theater was being able to bring incredible effects um, and things that now are done digitally onto live theater. This still remains my primary goal is I'm asked to do a lot of things that are the, that are the equivalent of computer graphics, but we do them live. And that's really important to me. I'm uh, not that I'm not a digital person. I need to feel it. This is why I especially need an audience. That feedback, as you all know from being performers, that feedback is crucial. So I moved to Oregon. I'm from Oregon and I knew I could bring with me my, my core team and I knew we could have a kind of focus and quality of life that was very important to me. We considered Las Vegas, but I'm, I'm a woods guy. I need, I need nature and I need mountains. I need my motorcycles. So I want to invite you into this space. Uh, we built four buildings that are custom built for what we do. Some of them are hardcore industrial fabrication. Others are dance studios with rigging and lighting. Others are the costume shop. And then we have a very interesting composite shop. That's where we make, where we make the super lightweight carbon fibers that make up the, uh, the lightweight work we're known for. Let's go inside. In 1995, Disney was doing a little movie called The Lion King and they wondered how they could bring it to life. We knew the theme parks, we knew that eventually a, 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 maybe a Broadway show could happen with The Lion King and I'm very proud to have been part of it. When the movie was being drawn, I was able to work with the animators and give early advice, not to them, but to the live theater version of The Lion King and um, it's, it was the vehicle that allowed me to move my entire operation to the West Coast because in New York in 1997 when we opened The Lion King, it was a sensation. And what it did for theater and my world is it brought a certain spiritual analog to effects. And The Lion King is really honest and I've, it's important to say this because in Las Vegas this is very important too. We show the craft, we show the real humanity of our performers and you'll see that the work I show you that I've done in Las Vegas has always been about that uh, an incredible sense of beauty and craftsmanship and artistry and sculptural quality but always right behind the qualities of the performance and the connection the storytelling from the human to human contact so we'll talk a lot about that because I mostly create synthetic characters but I do them in the most um, authentic way I can and they're always usually in collaboration uh, or a duality with the human performer. I'm not a big fan of taking my form of puppetry and hiding it in a box. There's a great performer behind that puppet. Embrace it. Allow it to happen. It was the real key to my first work with Cirque du Soleil, which was invited, I was invited by Robert Lepage when he was doing Ka. He saw all of the acrobatics and wonderful, extraordinary contortionists and, and acro dancers and wondered, is there a way, we were writing a story about the natural world, is there a way in which the human can become animal in a seamless duality? So it became the, the first spark of work I did for Cirque du Soleil is looking at the great figures and, 
and uh, movements that were already inherent in the circus world and deciding how I, I could do an overlay to supplement it, to not in no way detract from its extraordinary base skill. So it's really the hybridization of dance and human movement that became the starting point of my work and really the work that connected to the audience. The audience, in the case of talking about characters and puppetry, our audience is expert in human forms. They're pretty expert in animal forms. They understand when something is right, when something is wrong, especially with a human. They are, without even knowing it on a subconscious level, you know the human body. That's why we play with that, with costuming. We play with that with proportion. We play with that with the, we, we tease the fantasy out of that equation where you think you understand the human. And now we represent the human in a way that is unusual to you. It makes you perk up, it makes you look. In fact, I use puppetry primarily for the reason it makes people look harder, because there's a cipher, there's a contradiction to this logic, and it makes it's how children are able to tell traumatic stories is through an avatar, through this vehicle. I find that it's not a substitution for the human; it is a balance to the human, and it allows the audience um, a metaphysical connection to them, their own selves by seeing an interpretation through an animated object. The magic of knowing that it is just foam and wood and, and then it can come to life and have spirit is an amazing magic trick in itself and it's one that we are constantly mining for effect. Our team is probably one of the most versatile teams that you'll find in the entertainment fabrication world. We're expert in artistry from almost every Artist down here has a degree in sculpture or some form of fine arts or commercial art. But then what we do, we, we've invented a lot of industrial processes. I'm a fanatic about carbon fiber, super lightweight composite materials. Here you see a, a, a group of eyeballs and even the mechanics, the inner lenses and everything are made of carbon fiber, which we manufacture ourselves. It is the thing, it's 40% lighter than fiberglass or other plastics. And if you, any of my shows that have big objects like The Lion King, they are on performers that don't need unnecessary weight. So we get more performance uh, and less stress on the human body by using super lightweight aeronautic materials. So we've become expert and worked with the, the, the engineering world of super lightweight composites. Um, even though at the end of it, it looks like what it's supposed to look like most of my work is what we call lightweight composite. I was describing the different components that go into our work, and the, one of the areas that we're most known for and I'm most proud is our composites program. Uh, this would be carbon fiber and Kevlar and the super lightweight materials that we've developed. Much of this came from the aeronautics industry. We've adapted it specifically into the theatrical industry, but we are certainly one of the few in the world that utilize these pain in the ass, complicated techniques to get at the results we need. So I'll show you one of the pieces being developed. This is the, uh, the frog from the Lake of Dreams at Wynn. We, we have him back in the studio to reprogram it, refresh it, putting some more lip animation, taking advantage of the benefits of newer technology. But this thing looks very small up on that uh, waterfall, but it's really gigantic. The eyes are uh, four feet in diameter. But this, is, this would not be possible without these two materials, carbon fiber and aluminum. So we engineer it heavily in a way that, um, if, in a sense, it's more like the way a bird is built with hollow bones and just the structure where you need it. My pieces don't have to fly in the air, so I can treat things fragilely um, we have such expert maintenance and operations people in our shows. We treat things that are, I mean, this is not, nothing different in Las Vegas from a feather headdress. That always had to be treated specially. My work does too. Uh, this is a good example of the carbon fiber. This is a bird's body that will have a puppeteer inside. So it has, these are vision ports. Um, but it, this is a carbon fiber wrapped around a special uh, honeycomb material that gives it incredible rigidity, but this whole piece only weighs a couple pounds. It will be covered completely. The audience will never see all this great technology and engineering and 
bits of titanium and aluminum, but what they will see is the translation of that lightweight, ergonomically designed character into performance. Um, this is the sound that makes me so comfortable and happy. There's grinders and buzzers. We only have half the team here because of the, the pandemic. We're working split teams. We have, um, fortunately, a big enough studio where we can isolate and work very separately, and it's been wonderful. We've been able to work through the pandemic um, on projects because we are uh, fortunate to be booked so many years in the future. Here we're looking at uh, the final bits for a, uh, a dinosaur costume, incredibly detailed because it's three feet away from the audience, but done in a way that Nike or Adidas would be proud of because they're so ergonomically designed with quick fittings and the way in which we get into a piece, the way in which it can magnetic close, it makes it, we think about our performers as the paramount thing, but we also think about the dressers, the hygienic qualities of maintenance, how long a piece will last, um, flammability, all the things that we hope the audience completely forgets about, never considers because it wants to just look like it was meant to happen. But those of you that know, it's incredibly detailed. One comment I have consistently with visitors to my studio is, I didn't think there was that much to it. They thought of puppetry as a little bit of wood with a couple strings, but the depth of engineering, forethought, ergonomics, and consideration about the storytelling, it's as broad of considerations that I've ever seen in any discipline, uh, in the arts or without. One of the biggest change here and in Las Vegas in general is the use of technology. This is Charles Babbage, my amazing art director, who brought me into a world of highly digitized connection to the art world. Here we're revising the well-known Winnie the Frog at uh, Lake of Dreams. We are reprogramming animation into the frog to make him sing some new songs and putting in new technologies. So now we're able to program the robotics on the computer and basically send that right to the drivers of the, of the robotic. This piece is 38 feet wide, 16 feet high. The cylinders that drive all of these motions are massive. So the ability to, in the comfort of our office, being able to do the programming, literally send it to another state to run is pretty extraordinary. And it's one of the things I wanted to point out of Las Vegas. The shows have been so technological and, and have grown so much with the mega shows, the spectacles, that the technology ha has come along with that. And so now we find ourselves in Las Vegas at being the epicenter of engineering robotics. Uh, UNLV has an amazing robotics program. You have amazing gurus like Scott Fisher who invented Navigator, which is a control system that runs all of the computers, all of the lifts, all the lighting, and all the heavy technology that you'd find on any Las Vegas stage, homegrown in Las Vegas. More and more we're considering animation in broader ways, and one of the one of the things I've been working a lot with is light and how it tells a story and, op and internally lighted objects. So we're able to, with today's technology and computer control, we're able to address every light. In this object, there's over 90,000 individually addressable lights. All of them can be a million colors and all of them can be addressed singly. So what we're finding, this is what I mean by um, new technology is being a storyteller. As long as it's in the hands of an artist and a storyteller, technology will always improve the scenario. An example I often give, if Michelangelo were alive today, he would be rocking the computer. Leonardo da Vinci would be rocking the computer, and they would find the best uses of it, and it would grow their abilities just like the state-of-the-art materials they were using at that time. Las Vegas has a a unique chemistry that has always done well with performers uh, and before my time I in, I intersected Las Vegas in 1990 with the Siegfried and Roy show but before that the foundation was laid for sort of an innovative uh, type of performance often very humanistic and intimate uh, the Rat Pack you know good or bad those those fellas had a unique uh, sort of community that was allowed to sort of flourish because of their closeness and the, sh the way they shared it. Um, and everybody, you know, incredible performers, 
uh, of the era pre 90s uh, and I'd have to say that in this crazy chemistry experiment that is Las Vegas the master chemist the alchemist is of course Steve and Elaine Wynn and with their vision things really changed uh, maybe it just appeared this way to me because there seemed to be a an invigoration of, uh, of a kind of uh, imagination in much the same way Walt Disney pushed imagination as the key component, so did Steve and Elaine. Coupled with an incredible sense of class and beauty, they took some of the shtick off Las Vegas and replaced it with credible uh, elegance, maturity, uh, a cultural awareness that is still to this day being enjoyed. Um, and then also, I, it's important to say, even though they were the catalyst, they were very intelligent in bringing in incredible creators from, you know, the, the, the big decision of bringing in Kenneth Feld and Bernie Eumann's Siegfried and Roy Act, turning it into the incredible vision that was the flagship of the Mirage Resort, which in itself was a pivot also in the resort world. Um, then bringing in Franco Dragone and Cirque du Soleil clearly was the most substantial entertainment gesture probably ever made in any in the world and in history the way that the shows mystere and oh and caw and zumanity and it's even hard to remember all of them and some of them that worked beautifully and still to this day and others that came and went you would have thought elvis with its subject of elvis and that relationship to vegas wouldn't have succeeded but it's a it's a it's a Risky Town, uh, fortunately Cirque du Soleil led by Franco Dragon, who, whose vision and sort of a heartfelt commitment to the emotion of the story connected with the audience in Las Vegas because so few audiences speak fully uh, one language that Franco found a universal language that connected so well. And then shows that I've had to, I've, I've, I've been involved with seven of the Cirque shows and then Franco's dark masterpiece, La Rev led by Rick Gray of the Wind Team. Uh, an incredible piece. Now a piece that is kind of historic in its, in its grasp, its reach, its risk. Um, the show was in fact uh, refreshed to be more beautiful because Franco took that, that, that dreamy path into the subconscious. And those of you that were able to enjoy and work on that first show, it's an incredible, masterpiece it really is and the bones of it are still the masterpiece that is La Rev today. Um, Kenny Ortega, an incredible visionary who helped make the Bellagio Fountains be a character who brought uh, a, a great life to the family audience at, at Treasure Island and then early in the Wynn Resorts development uh, Steve called on Kenny to find an, the imagination of, of the Wynn Resorts and that was the Lake of Dreams. Uh, that show I have a long history with, and uh, to this day, Kenny leads it like a, like, like a, like a father. Um, so it's an incredible group of people that came together under proper leadership and worked together and shared in a unique way. I've mentioned that it, there's a closeness and a collaboration among creators in Las Vegas that you don't find in other entertainment centers. Um, there's something that also extends into the audience. There's a shared, there's a shared love. There's a shared vision. There's a shared experience. Very important to note that um, people go to Las Vegas with friends and family. Some of us go alone. I go to shows alone. It's a very different experience than when I have when I share it with with loved ones and friends and family. That same sharing that has kind of created this entertainment opportunity extends into all the other aspects of visiting in Las Vegas. People laugh harder. They, it somehow strips away uh, and makes you more unfettered. You find, you know, the inner core of your playful, childlike self. And that's really important to note. It happens with friends and family. It also happens with business associates. The, the wonderful trade conventions we have there allows you to see, because of Las Vegas and its special sort of sauce, it allows you to see a different side of your collaborators, your workmates. And therefore, when you get back to the office, you've seen their, in a way, their true self. And there's something magical about Las Vegas, 
Um, there's something magic about the sort of this stew that has come together and will continue to be magic. I think Las Vegas itself probably doesn't even appreciate this sort of uh, brand that they have, that uh, it, it, it is about innovation, rawness, beauty, skill. There's a, there's a, a complete freedom in Las Vegas that you can't find anywhere else. Man, it's a, it's, it's a formula that, ha that happened that was curated and then some of it wasn't so curated, but it did come together to become this extraordinary place that I'm proud to have such a history with. It's been 30 years now since I've been working in Las Vegas and I, it's been the best 30 years of my life, certainly, because it, um, professionally they've, they've challenged me. Uh, we've all, all of us creators have risen to that challenge and the audience have appreciated it and they've taken home the magic that we've offered them and it still lives with them every day. I first encountered Las Vegas in the 90s, actually the late 80s. Um, in New York, Siegfried and Roy was at Radio City Music Hall looking at uh, putting their show at Radio City Music Hall. Some of you might remember because one of the tiger, one of the vans with the tiger in it was stolen in Manhattan by a car thief. Didn't know, wasn't trying to steal a tiger. And four blocks later, they suddenly had reports of a, uh, of a empty van with the passenger doors open left in the middle of Fifth Avenue. And in the back, they'd finally realized that they had uh, a white tiger. Uh, in those years, that was 1988, and Siegfried and Roy were presenting at Madison Square Garden. I had an opportunity through a mutual friend because they were fishing for uh, a new spectacle in Las Vegas, which became the Siegfried and Roy Show at the Mirage, which opened in 1990 and ran for 14 years as the most successful show in the magic world and in history. Extraordinary show, an incredible start for me, but John Napier, the Brit, he was at the peak of his, uh, peak of his uh, uh, prowess as a, as a designer. Um, he knew about me and uh, one thing led to another and we were looking at creating a, a, a wonderful illusion on stage that would be what is now called the Puppet Army. But it was 12 dancers that we wanted to turn into 120 dancers. So we did a thing that was invented in the 18th century in French circus, it's corporal puppetry where you would attach um, other characters to a common character. In this case, in the Puppet Army in Las Vegas, we have a center dancer, uh, female dancers, and on a wheelbase extends five figure, uh, uh, four figures on the sides of her, three more and one more at the top, with bristling with flags, and all of the material was a super lightweight plastic composite, gold leaf, so there was this wall of gold and motion, and it was really an effective illusion, because for a moment, and even throughout the number, other, some people didn't get it, but there's an excitement in figuring out the trick. In magic, there's a couple kinds of tricks, ones that you never want to give up how it works. Others are sight play or, or uh, visual tricks, such as the case of the Puppet Army, because at different times in the audience, you, you heard a gasp of, oh, I finally, I get it. There's only one person, and, but it was such a convincing illusion that it played that wonderful game between fantasy and reality. The game between fantasy and reality is kind of the key, the linchpin of what Las Vegas is about. It is wonderfully isolated, and I think it wouldn't quite be the same if it wasn't in the meadows and in the desert. Las Vegas means the meadows. But it, its isolation allowed this sort of fishbowl of uniqueness. Um, things were done there that have never been done anywhere else in the world, and it allowed the everyday guest, as soon as you got off the airplane or drove into Las Vegas, you sort of entered a fantasy land. Um, literally, uh, everything was heightened. Everything seemed like it was a, a game, a mirage. Uh, and so it, people adopted that attitude and they became kind of um, carefree. Their imagination was wide open, meaning they were letting influence into their, into their mind. So a magic show, uh, an illusion show, uh, a Cirque du Soleil spectacle could make a huge impression on them. In a way, it, it kind of wiped clean your palate through, all, through this purpose-built city that was really about, um, you know, it's really about pleasure and it's about fun, playful fun. Um, I think that there's a, there's a seriousness to fun 
that we've made, we've made it into an industry, the idea of giving pleasure, giving um, uh, a release from the troubles of life. Never been, been more important right now for us to get back to work. And um, the world will be pent up with a lot of uh, introspection, uh, overly serious uh, considerations, you know? It, the world is in a really upside down time right now. It's giving us a chance actually to refresh ourselves. There's a silver lining to this cloud. And uh, like I said earlier, it's a bit of making lemonade from lemons. We at my studio have been uh, taking the time to, we have a lot of ideas along the way that we'd love to perfect and push. And so we're, we're taking that moment to experiment and to invent the next generation of the methods, materials, and designs that we do. I think that Las Vegas, it's important to note, out, to note that it seems things that succeed there seems to be something you can't find anywhere else in the world. I bragged about The Lion King being the most successful show on earth, which it is. We've had 20 productions, but we only lasted a year and a half in Las Vegas. We intended to be there five or 10 years. We put a, we put a full production there. We shortened the show from the Broadway version to fit the, the, the 75 minute mark that is desirable for Vegas shows. And yet it, it didn't work. And I think not because of the quality of the show, because it lived somewhere else. It was no longer something you can only see in Las Vegas. So if you look at, if you just do your own personal survey of what has really worked in Las Vegas, it has been the unique show. Or it has been a unique individual. Headliners do quite well because that's a real thing that can only be found where that headliner is sitting. So I'm really proud to say that Las Vegas has developed its own um, vocabulary of what works there. And that's what makes it further unique. I think a lot of people think they've figured that out, but Las Vegas, it's not a, it's not a uh, easy city to play in. It's, um, it seems to be a, the kind of shows there, they have to be provocative in your, in, in, in your mind. They have to be intelligent shows that, 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 that respond to intelligent audience. But at the same time, it's, think of the language barriers. There's always 25% of the people who do not speak English in any of our shows. And so it has to be a visual show that can tell that story simply. So one thing that we found in Las Vegas, if you get, um, and this is in no way saying that Las Vegas has been dumbed down, but it deals with a much more sensory level of entertainment. And the ask of the viewer is much more emotional, sensory based, and it's like all the five senses have to be tingling, or you don't really connect with that Las Vegas guest. I love that challenge. I get the pleasure of working on Broadway, I work in international opera, I do a lot of Olympics opening ceremonies, I do a lot of heady theater and avant-garde dance. Las Vegas is really often where I get to play, and in a way, I feel home there. One thing that's important to say about Las Vegas is that it, is, it has so many tourists moving in and out, it's very interesting the contrast to the residents. The, sh the people who maintain the shows, the performers in the show, they become the family, the consistency. Everybody else is moving in and out. I think people have this impression of Las Vegas as a fluid thing that's impermanent, when in fact they don't understand that the, the depth of commitment to the families and the individuals who not only work there but love the place. And I've always had a special attraction to it. I, I kind of live there, I'm there so much, and I've had such great opportunities there. And largely it's because, it, interestingly enough, it's a very open place to communicate with others. There are, throughout the history of Las Vegas, there have been the restaurants, the bars, where the performers go after the show. And it's different than New York, which, you know, I started my career and still work heavily in New York, uh, or LA. There's, a, there's not an openness, there's not a connectivity that, that you find in Las Vegas. And some of it has to do with its, its wonderful isolation in this sort of wonderful bowl in the middle of Nevada. Uh, it's an extraordinarily rare thing, and I think that people feel that when they're there. It, it, they, they come excited, they may leave exhausted, but they're still excited. And the amount of return visitors that come to Las Vegas is testament to, how, to the impact it made on people. I wanted to talk a little bit about th this moment, this pandemic, and um, um, some coping mechanisms that I have seen work for others. I've been especially interested in 
I'm interested in the creative process. I think creativity is a gift given to humans only that you don't find in any other species. Um, I ask this, I'm, I'm kind of a geek about zoology and animals because I'm the animal king. I, I have made so many. I've learned a great deal about life through the sort of parable of the animal. And I've asked many animal, animal behavioralists, zoologists, very professional people, this question. Do we find creativity in the animal world? Do we find artistry? Um, they bring up the briar bird who decorates his nest with blue bits of things. Uh, they talk about whale song. We talk about different evidence of what seems to be beauty in nature. But all of it is disproven by it. It is all about getting a date. The briar bird does it to get a mate. This whale song, you know, there's almost every hope that we have that, and that art and the exploration of self and expression would be found in other species, but no, it seems to be found only in humans. I find that a, an incredible gift. And many important people, as they've aged and look back on their life, have made it a point that artistry and creativity and that culture that it brings is actually the defining characteristic that is redeeming about the human on Earth. And I, th I find it interesting to embrace this and ask your own question, how do, what does that mean to you? So the coping mechanism I was going to talk about, about now is um, a journal, a way in which you can track the thoughts. It's very rare that you have an opportunity to, um, we all say, I'm going to take a sabbatical. I'm going to really get away and I'm just gonna collect my thoughts. I'm gonna get my shit together, whatever you do say for yourself. But this is a time that's actually happening. And what I'm starting to see is a, um, a ricochet effect where people are learning something about themselves or else they're taking time for the hobbies, which in fact gives them incredible pleasure. Uh, many of the hobbies are associated with the skill that they're already involved in. And many, uh, it's turning into volunteerism. I actually think Black Lives Matter and this social justice that we're craving for now is because we have looked inside ourselves and found some core strengths. I'm really encouraged. I hate the suffering that's going on. I don't like this temporary pause and the, uh, the way that we weren't prepared for it. But I do know that there'll be another side to this. And with it will come these, um, these gifts, these moments, this journal, your thoughts. I would ask that in your journal, mine aren't even filled with art. They're mostly filled with writing and uh, you know, bad poetry, an observation I might have heard on the subway. But the act of physicality and the mind together commits something to thought. People say, write it down and you want to remember it. You also write it down to study and meditate about a subject. I find it, it's not just because I'm an artist and I learned to draw early, I find that it's really important. So this blue book, um, I have 400 of, and I've always had the same color, same size, so because it fits in my hand so well. My great dear departed friend, Mark Fisher, the incredible designer of Kaw and many others. I know that Stu Fish, his company, is part of this talk. Enjoy that. But Mark Fisher is famous for his, his notebooks, and they were his brain. And it's very interesting, something so simple as this. Um, and I might say, I don't get writer's block or artist block very often, but what I do when I have that happen, I go pull one of these blue books randomly out of the bookshelf, I crack it open, and what it does, it's not the answer I'm looking for, it's the process I'm looking for. What it seems to do is summon up in me a, a train of thought, a new direction, and I invariably break that writer's block. So it's, you know, I'm not here to give advice or lessons, but I have been paying particular attention to how the creative community around the world that I'm connected with closely, how they've been coping, and what kind of personality is coping better than others. You certainly realize that artists have great coping skills. They chose an impossible career anyway. They were often oddball children or just a little bit left turn, and, and they, they made, they turned that in, that self-exploration, that uh, dedication often, uh, the oddball person is often an altruist, somebody who can really dedicate themselves to a specific skill. And you ask any cellist, 
you ask any um, a German wheel artist, you ask any uh, dancer, the amount of effort that you have to put just to get to the basic level to compete in this world is extraordinary. So you already possess superhuman abilities to concentrate and focus. I'm suggesting that you do need to concentrate on the career that you've had to this point, but also that skill and the, the sense of dedication and um, your incredible mind has been attuned now to great things. And you can expand and you can do workarounds and you can find coping mechanisms that you may even in the past, in retrospect, say, in a weird way, that did some good. Um, it's, a, it's a strange metaphor to make, but when there are many people that survive cancer who say that even though they wouldn't wish this on anybody, the evolution that they made as a person was extraordinary and, and somehow worth it in a symbolic way. So I don't want to say anything discouraging. I want to say things that are encouraging. Running a team like mine, uh, and all the shows I'm connected to, I'm, you have to be a bit of a coach. And you all know what that means. You know, you have to be the one who's, who's encouraging somebody to reach that next level. And I find myself doing that across the industry as well. And I, I've been through SARS, I've been through MERS, I've nothing like this, but we have certainly seen events that have taken down theater and made people question going out of their homes. Um, I think that there is going to be a change in the way that we present art, the way that we view art in theater, in our case, or a live performance. But I think it'll always be about the same virtues, storytelling, connecting with the, with the individual. Uh, it's about artists finding a means to express the depth of emotion and thought and the, their need to share. So we will always find new ways to share. The Zoom call can be quite amazing. We thought it was gonna be this static, impassionate thing but no people are crying the same way they did when they were face to face people are laughing the same way they did so we would just find new tools um, the storytelling the basics of storytelling goes back you know millennia and to the first person who did their first shadow puppetry with fire but we will always have the base need to connect I don't believe in artists who do art for self therapy it's a cry to connect the need to express isn't just for yourself, it is for others. And it's quite a presumptuous thing to think that you have something so important to say to others. But this is the basis of the community, it's connection. Artists have a gift and a very, very much a need, um, and we're starting to see that more and more in life. Frankly, as, a, as life gets more automated, as your life is not spent as a field laborer or working manual labor because conveniences of technology, it's allowed us more time for introspection, for art, and it's probably opened up our eyes for um, this, you know, it was free time that gave some of my favorite cultures the great art. Many hunter-gatherer societies in the past that cr created extraordinary art, pre-Columbian art, were, um, were given lots of extra time because they had been so good at hunter-gathering it's been proven that there's a lot of extra time on their hands. Where do humans spend extra time? They storytell, they play. Um, and this is what I, I think we'll continue doing into the future. I may have an outsized enthusiasm for what I do and what we do, um, but my favorite thing in the world is, is to share my world and share the process and share the love and care that my team here gives every day to this industry and to our particular product. It's really kind of wonderful to have something that speaks to you, that you're really interested in doing. It's quite easy to do the hard work if you really have an interest in something. Um, I keep finding myself wanting to give advice because people are, in, people are suffering. And I guess the only advice I could give was one you've already given yourself. Find the thing you love and really work hard at it because it will be easy work. Uh, you'll become expert and enjoy the process. It's not some trial put on you in life that you are forced to do anything you choose to do. You have to do it with love. And in terms of being a performer or a storyteller like we are, that's your audience is very smart. They smell artifice. They smell something inauthentic. 
So if you have a love for it, it's going to no doubt be conveyed to the audience and therefore the world. What I think artists sometimes don't understand is they, the, uh, how important they are as a symbol for life because it seems like maybe a bit of a, you know, a unnecessary thing, it's a bit of a whim, somebody, but, but it's really impressive to people. And when you are being altruistic about really what it is you love, you're going to do your best work and that supports the community. That, that inspiration to them is incalculable but very important. So, I loved having you here. Um, I can't wait till I can see you in person. It's Michael Curry saying goodbye.